Amen. Amen. All right, now we're in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. And look back at verse number 1. It says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as, the day, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And the part of the chapter I want to focus on is going to be found in verse number three, where it says, let no man deceive you by any means. And the top of my sermon is this, means of deception, means of deception. So let's first establish what the word deception even means, or to be deceived. Now, deceive, the dictionary definition of deceive is this, is to cause someone to believe something that is not true, typically in order to gain some personal advantage. So in other words, when someone is deceived, they're being tricked by someone else. Now, the Bible talks a lot about deception. It talks a lot about people deceiving other people. And we can see that all throughout the Bible. First of all, you don't have to turn to any of these, but I'm just going to list off a few people who are deceivers or the Bible mentions as deceivers. It says in Titus chapter number one, verse 10, it says, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. So we have people that are vain talkers and deceivers, and it says especially they of the circumcision. A lot of these Jews out there, they're deceivers. Not only that, the Bible says in Revelation 12, 9, the most or the greatest deceiver out there is Satan. It says in Revelation 12, 9, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So the Bible talks about Satan being a great deceiver. Not only that, the Bible says in 2 John chapter number 1, verse 7, it says, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. It talks about people who don't believe that Jesus has come in the flesh. The Bible calls that person a deceiver. It calls them an antichrist. It calls them a wicked person. And my last one is this. It says in 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse 13, it says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And there's that also just other wicked people out there that their goal is just to deceive you and they're being deceived themselves. So the Bible talks a lot about deception, talks a lot about people deceiving other people. Even Jesus himself, you can go with me to Matthew chapter number 24, Matthew 24. Jesus talks about being deceived over and over and over and over again in just Matthew 24 alone. Once you get there to Matthew 24, look at verse number 4, Matthew 24, 4. And the Bible reads in Matthew 24, 4, it says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Matthew 24, 5, it says, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. It says in Matthew 24, 11, and many, shall, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And lastly, in Matthew 24, 24, the Bible says, For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show signs show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So the Bible talks about it even in Matthew 24 over and over again. Jesus is warning about deceivers creeping in. Jesus is constantly saying, take heed that no man deceives you. Don't let anyone be... Uh, don't let anyone out there try to deceive you. And even says in Matthew 24, 24, that it's, pos it's, that it's not possible, but in so much that these deceivers are so tricky that, it's po that it could have been, it, I'm trying to get my words out, that it, it's all, it would be almost, if it were possible, they would be, deceive the very elect. They would deceive even saved people if it were possible, but it's not possible because we're saved. And that's the good news. Now, the thing is, a lot of people would think, oh, well, I've never been deceived. Well, the Bible says that we've all been deceived. Titus 3.3. 3, it says, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lust and pleasures, hate, uh, living in malice and envy and hateful and hating one another. So the Bible talks about all of us have been deceived once in our life. You know, if anyone who's met Garrett Kirchway shaking his, take, uh, shaking his hand or even listened to one of his sermon has been deceived. And what I want to go over today is just a few ways that people deceive us as Christians. And that's where the title of my sermon comes from, means of deception. Now go ahead and go with me to 1 Kings chapter number 13. 1 Kings chapter number 13. 
The Bible talks about this in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 11. It says, Let's, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. The Bible says we should not be ignorant of Satan's devices. And Satan uses people to deceive Christians because Satan can't be in every place at, at every time and every moment. So he has to use his minions. He has to use wicked people to go out and deceive other, to deceive us as Christians. And the Bible says that we should not be ignorant of his his devices. We shouldn't be ignorant of the things that Satan uses to trick us. Now, my first point is this, is that, and it's a really simple point, but the easiest way that people end up deceiving us as Christians is just through lies. Now, in Colossians chapter number two, verse eight, you don't have to turn there. It says, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. So the Bible's saying that we shouldn't be tricked or we need to beware. We need to be careful that we're not tricked by people using vain philosophy and deceit. The Bible says in Ephesians 5 and 6, it says, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. The Bible says don't let people trick you with vain words, where they say a lot of vain emptiness. You shouldn't be tricked by that, and you shouldn't let people deceive you through lies. Now, I have you go. To, I had you go to First Kings chapter number thirteen because this is a really good chapter to explain how there's people out there who just simply lie to get gain or to get what they want. Now, it says, um, just bring you up to speed in the story is Jeroboam ends up becoming king of Israel, and Jeroboam is a really wicked king. He ends up setting up two um, uh, calves for the children of Israel to worship. Uh, in this chapter, what ends up happening is he's burning altar, or he's burning incense on an altar, and a man of God ends up coming to him and rebukes him, saying that the bones of the priests are going to be burnt on an altar by Josiah, and not only that, that the altar was going to be rent. So the altar ends up getting rent, and uh, Jeroboam ends up saying, we need to get this guy, and he tries to get his men to get him. So while he's doing that, his arm, and he has his arm out, his arm ends up becoming withered. And we get into the story in verse 6. If you look down at verse 6 of 1 Kings 13, the Bible reads, and it says, And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and became as it was before. So the man of God, he ends up praying or talking to the man of God. The man of God prays and restores his hand back to normal. Now it says in verse 7, And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so was it charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So when he went, so he went another way, and returned not the way that he came to Bethel. Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel, and the words which he spake unto the king, them they told also to their father. So what ends up going on is that because he healed, because this man of God ended up healing Jeroboam, he, the guy wants to reward, or Jeroboam wants to reward that man of God. And the man of God says, no, I don't want to take your reward because God has told me not to eat anything of some, you know, not to eat any bread nor drink any water, nor come the same way that I ended up leaving, or that come, leave the same way that I ended up coming in. So he ends up leaving, and then there's this prophet, and his sons end up hearing this, and they end up telling him what went on, and they tell him every all the words. Because if you look at back at verse 11, it says, they told, they, them told, they told also to their father. So they tell him everything that they ended up hearing. So this old prophet knows that Jeroboam, uh, or sorry, that the man of God's not supposed to eat anything, drink anything, or come the same way or leave the same way he ends up coming. So look down to verse 15, because what ends up happening is that the guys, the guy ends up meeting the man of God, and he says this. It says in verse 15, Then he said unto to him, 
come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee, neither will I eat the bread, eat bread, nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, thou shalt eat bread, that thou shalt eat no bread, nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. And look at verse 18, it says, and he said unto him, I am a I am a prophet also, as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. So what's going on is this, is that the man of God reiterates what he told Jeroboam, that I can't eat any bread, I can't drink any water, and I can't come in, I can't leave the same way I ended up coming in. He tells the man of God, or this prophet that, and the prophet ends up saying, well, you know what ends up, what ended up happening is actually an angel came and told me that I should, that you can come and eat at my house. That's not a big deal. And the Bible distinctly says that he, but he lied unto him. So we want to keep that in mind is that this guy, even though he ended up hearing all this stuff that his children ended up telling him, he knew that he wasn't, the man of God was not supposed to do those things, but he ended up lying unto him. Like I said, let's keep that in mind. We'll just go and finish up the story. It says in verse 19, so he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water. And it came to pass as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back and he cried unto the old man so the same prophet that ended up tricking him that lied to him it says and he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah saying thus saith the Lord for as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee but camest back and hast eaten bread and drunk water in the place of which the Lord did say to thee, eat no bread, drink no water, thy carcass shall not come unto thy, thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulchre of thy fathers. So we see here what ends up happening is this, is that the man of God, and I got my, okay, here we go, ends up getting rebuked because he did the wrong thing. He ended up Doing, he ended up disobeying God's word. It says in verse 23, it says, And it came to pass, after, after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk, that he saddled for, his ass, for, for him the ass to wit, for the prophet whom he brought back. And he was gone, a lion, and when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him, and his carcass was cast in the way, and the ass stood by it. The lion also stood by the carcass, and behold, men passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way, and the lion standing by the carcass, and they came and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. And in verse 26, it says, And when the prophet that brought him back from the way heard thereof, he said, and look at this, look, this guy is a weird guy. It says, It is the man of God whom was disobedient unto the word of the Lord. Therefore the Lord hath delivered him unto the lion, which hath torn him and slain him according to the word of the Lord, which he spake unto him. So the same guy who's telling him to go eat in his house and drink and all this stuff and come back with him um, on his way to Bethel is the same guy that's saying, is, this, is not this the man of God that was disobedient to the word of the Lord? So this guy is a really weird guy and he's a wicked person because he ends up tricking this guy. He hears, this, hears that this man is not supposed to do it and then he purposely deceives this man to be disobedient to God's word and then the man gets killed for it. And I'm not going to read the rest of the story, but what ends up, uh, ends up happening is the guy ends up getting the guy's carcass and then he ends up um, burying it, and then he gets buried. He tells his children to get buried, that he wants to be buried with him. Now go back to verse 18, or verse 17, because I want to get you, I want you to understand a principle for, from this. I just want to bring you up to speed in that story so you can understand a principle from this passage. It says back in verse 17, For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt, not, thou shalt eat no bread, nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. So the man of God is telling him, all the stuff that God told him. And it says, back in verse 18, it says, And he said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. And look at this, it says, And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring, me back with, bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. So this guy is a total liar. And the key thing I want you to focus on says that he said an angel spake unto him. Now the Bible talks about angels speaking unto people, what, a false gospel. If you want, you can go ahead and go with me to Galatians chapter number one. Galatians chapter number one. 
And in Galatians 1, it talks about people preaching another gospel. It says in Galatians 1 and verse 6, when you get there, Galatians 1, and you can look at verse 6, and it says, I marvel that ye are so soon, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that is called that from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there are some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that ye have received, let him be accursed. The Bible's really clear. If some guy or if an angel comes onto you and starts preaching some other gospel, let it be accursed. You know, let that person, if someone tell, tells you that some angel came and told him some gospel and they want you to listen to him, let that person be accursed. And the principle I want to get at is that not everyone who names the name of Christ is saved. And there are people who try to creep in churches like these to deceive other Christians. Because think about it like this. We've already fought the, the repent of your sins crowd. I don't think any repent of your sins person, I mean, obviously there are going to be people or infiltrators who are going to try coming in here, but they're not going to deceive anyone in this church because that's a thing that we take a really hard stance on. The devil is going to get crafty in the things he does. And what the devil is going to do is he's not going to just send some repent of your sins person or some Calvinist in here. He's going to send someone who has the right gospel to try to deceive people in this church. He's going to send some guy who says the right things. And that person's going to give you all the right answers when you try to question about salvation. They're going to say salvation is eternal, that it can't be lost, that it's not by works. But the thing is, you want to know what I believe that person is? They're pointing to another Jesus, just like the modalists. And that's the people I think of the most when I think of this, is that the modalists are really deceptive because the modalists try to say, oh, look at all the stuff I agree with you on. I agree that Jesus Christ is God. I agree with you that um, salvation is by faith, that it's, it's not by works, that it's eternal. But what are they pointing you to? They're pointing you to a totally different Jesus, right. a Jesus that doesn't save, a Jesus that is a deceptive <laughs> Jesus that says he's God the Father. Right. It's a lot of garbage, but people need to understand that there's people, and that's why I kept emphasizing it says, but he lied unto him. Now, think of our lives are written like the Bible, and whenever you're talking to someone, and it says that this person, you're talking to them, you're questioning about the gospel, and they give you all the right answers, but then that narrator of your life says, but he lied unto him. And that probably happens way more often than we think, where people are lying to us, trying to deceive us. And that's something we need to be really, really careful about. Because the devil knows that, like I said earlier, he's not going to just send all these false prophets in where they're, they're going to sit there and say things that we're just totally against. He's going to send someone in that's just going to plain out or plain out lie to us so that they can come in and try to creep in and deceive people in the church. This is another reason why I don't believe homos can get saved. And when you give the gospel to a homo and the homo gives you all the right answers after you're finished pre presenting the gospel to him, I believe that homo is just lying to you. That's It's that simple. And I believe that they're just trying to get in churches just and, and creep in and try to molest people. And that's why they're going to say that. They're going to, because what is a homo what did they ultimately do? They rejected the gospel. Therefore, since they have rejected the gospel, that person has become a reprobate. Well, Amen. then if they've rejected the gospel, they have to know the gospel to reject it. So there's probably many homos out there who can quote to you the gospel word for word. They know what to say. They know exactly what to, that, what to, what to tell you so that they can creep into a church like this and end up trying to do something, you know, molest some kid or do something wicked to someone in this church. So we need to be aware of that. We, not, we shouldn't just be people. People who just trust everyone. Now, obviously, we shouldn't. We should give people the benefit of the doubt. You know, I'm not sitting there saying go on a witch hunt and just sit there and think everyone is unsaved in this room. And yeah, I can't trust anyone. I can't trust my wife. I can't trust my kids. No, it shouldn't be like that. You should obviously give everyone the benefit of the doubt. But there is a way to try the spirits. The Bible says in First John chapter number four, it says, "Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world." So the reason I'm bringing that up, and I kind of emphasize, because I know you guys are like, why is he reading through 1 Kings chapter number 13? Because there is a principle that you can understand from that chapter. And I just want you to understand that really well. Because what did the man of God do? He ended up getting the word of God. He heard the word of God himself. He knew what the word of God said. 
But then you have a false prophet or a prophet that comes and says some angel told me something totally different. What was his issue is that God didn't trust in the word of God. He didn't try the guy's spirit from what God told him. And that's the problem we as a lot of Christians end up uh, going through is that we don't try the spirits with the word of God. We think if someone's just a nice person, we think if someone just comes to our church and they go soul winning with us, that that person is automatically saved and they're a good person. They can never, they'll never harm a fly. Well, we need to be, get the Bible and make sure we try the spirit. And like I, I'm bringing up modalism again is because they can say that they believe everything like us. And that's what if you want to know what a, a false prophet or you, if you want to know if someone's a false prophet, if they say, oh, we believe the same thing as you guys. But that's like Mormons say that right. Jehovah's Witnesses say that. And they obviously don't believe the same things we do. They believe something totally different. But. Just thinking about the molas, for, for instance, is that they say, oh, we believe everything just like you. And what do they try to do? They try to creep in and spread their false molas doctrine so that they can deceive people. And look at all the wicked people who have been kicked out of faithful word. And look at all the trouble they're causing on the Internet. Sitting there railing on pastor, railing on all these different good pastors in our movement. And they're sitting there trying to deceive people and get people taken out of good churches to go to their wicked, hell-bound church. So it's something we need to be careful of. And you guys don't want to see that happen at this church because it's not a matter of if a false prophet's going to come in here it's a matter of when because a false prophet will come in here but we just don't know when it's going to happen that's the thing about it and you want to be alert to not just trust everybody just because they come to this church or because they're a nice guy or because they go soul winning i went soul winning with all the molas you know i trusted them i thought they were good people even i mean pastor put a lot of stock in tyler baker thinking that he i mean he made him the deacon so we trusted these people, but they turned out to be frauds. They turned out to be deceivers and really wicked people. So it's something you need to be aware about. Just don't trust everyone. That's why, you know, and something that's really emphasized, don't just leave your kids with anybody. You know, you can't just trust people with your kids. I'll trust people with my gun more than I trust people with my kids because I'm not going to give my kids away. You can take my gun or whatever. Who cares? Even shoot me with it. But you're not going to take my kid away because you just can't trust people like that or you can't just trust people randomly. Now go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter number uh, 11. 2 Corinthians 11. While you're turning there, this is talking about Jesus. And I remember reading this years and years and years ago, and I just thought it was interesting. But in, in Luke chapter number 20, verse 20, it says, and they watched him, like I said, this is talking about Jesus, and sent forth spies which should fiend themselves just men that they might take hold of his words that so that so they might deliver him unto the power and authority of the governor. So it says that there are many, there, that in Jesus' day, that there are these people that they fiend themselves as just men. They acted like they were just people in the church. They acted like, oh yeah, we follow you, we like you, Jesus, we're, you know, we're all for you. I love Jesus. They have like a I love Jesus shirt <laughs> under their you know, uh, <laughs> dress shirt or something. But these people were faking it. They were trying to deceive Jesus. And what are they trying to do? They're trying to ask him all these questions so they can try getting him to say something wrong and trip him up so they can go report him to the authorities. They can go report him to YouTube or something. I'm just joking. <laughs> but in 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, it says in verse 13, it says, For such... For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, trans transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into a minister, uh, into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his angels, or if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So the Bible says in verse 13 that. You know, there's many false prophets out there. There are many deceitful work, workers. And what are they doing? The Bible says they're transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. They're transforming themselves to people who come to this church or people who are trying to serve God. But it says even the Satan himself is transformed to an angel of light. You know, when we think of Satan a lot of the time, just because uh, I guess all Hollywood and stuff, they make him to look like this ugly, you know, wicked person. But that's probably not how Satan looks like. Satan probably looks a lot better than we think because the Bible says he's transformed to an angel of light. He's probably someone that if you look, you'll probably look at his beauty. And the Bible talks about in Ezekiel chapter number, I believe, 28, that he had a lot of beauty. So he's probably not just this ugly person or this ugly being or whatever. He's probably some Something that's beautiful to look upon but the thing is even though he's that beautiful he's deceptive and that's something you need to take in mind but the Bible says that 
um, his, his ministers are going to transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. They're going to act like they're just people. They're going to act like they have all these morals. They're going to act like they have all these standards. They're going to act like they're these really good Christians. But the thing is, they're going to try to deceive you. And the Bible says whose ends shall be according to their works. So we need to watch out for that. I'm not saying, you know, just do a 180 after you've gotten saved and like start living a wicked life so people won't think you're a, a, a infiltrator or a false prophet or anything. But what I am saying is this, is that you need to watch out for people. I mean, obviously we should trust people, we should love people, but we shouldn't just be too trusting of everyone. And we need to make sure that we don't just just put like, kind of put our hearts out for everyone and everything. We need to make sure we try the spirits and try people. Now, that's my first point is that one mean of deception or one motive or method of, method of deception is through lies. It's through people trying to act like they're, like act different than what they really are. But my second one is this, and go with me to Romans chapter number 16, Romans 16. But my second point is that there's deception through flattery. And that's a really big thing that people need to watch out for, is that you need to watch out for people who are flatterers. The Bible says in Psalm chapter number 12, verse 2, they speak vanity everyone with his neighbor, with flattering lips, and with a double heart do they speak. So Paul's talking about people who flatter. They actually have a double heart. Their heart is different than what they're actually saying because they don't, they're just trying to get some... They're trying to deceive you and get some gain from you. It says in Psalm 36, 2, it says, For he flattereth himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found hateful. The Bible says, I had you turn to Romans chapter number 16. Pastor actually preached this this morning, so I guess it needs to be heard because it's preached twice. Amen. But it says uh, in Romans 16, and I didn't copy his sermon. I already had this written, so <laughs> don't worry. It was the Holy Spirit that <laughs> just laid it upon both of our hearts. But it says in Romans 17, 17, or sorry, Romans 16, 17. If you have a Romans 17, 17, then you need to throw out the Bible because that's not the right Bible. <laughs> that's a false Bible. <laughs> so in Romans 16, 17, the Bible says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own bellies, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. So the Bible is saying this, is that there are, we need to mark those people who cause divisions contrary to, to the doctrine that we've learned and avoid those people. And the Bible is really clear about that. But in verse 18, it says, because those people don't serve God and they serve their own bellies. And it says this, by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. What does that sound like to you? That sounds like flattery to me, that these people are deceiving people's hearts through good words and fair speeches. They're saying things that are right. They're saying things that you want to hear. They're saying things that are going to gravitate you towards them. So why, why is that? So they can eventually deceive you and bring, them, and bring you down with them into whatever snare they want to bring you into. Now go with me to Proverbs chapter number 6. Proverbs chapter number 6. While you're turning there, I'm going to read a few verses from Proverbs. It says in Proverbs 20, 26, 28, A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it, and a flattering mouth worketh ruin. So people who are just people, we hate lies. We hate when people lie. We hate people who are just keep bringing up lies. And we hate those people who are affected by those lies. But it says, but a, a flattering tongue a flattering mouth worketh ruin. Someone who's a flatterer, they're just there to ruin your life. They don't care about you. It says in Proverbs 28, 23, He that rebuketh a man afterwards shall find more favor than he that flattereth with the tongue. So it talks about someone who rebukes their neighbor, where their neighbor is doing something wrong, and they tell them, hey, what you're doing is wrong, and they correct that person. It says they shall find more favor. The Bible talks about if uh, rebuke a wise man and he will love thee. So if you rebuke someone who's wise, that person's going to love you. But it says that they're going to find more favor than him that flattereth with his tongue. So if you're someone or if a person's just always flattering you, even when you're doing wrong, then that person is obviously a deceptive person. Something's wrong with them. It says in Proverbs 29, 25, or Proverbs 29, 5, a man that flattereth his neighbor spreadeth a net 
for his feet. So someone who's just there to flatter you is trying to kind of butter you up to deceive you in some way, form, or fashion. So it's something you need to watch out for. When someone, all they do is just talk flattery to you. Oh, you look nice today. Like every minute <laughs> that they see you, they keep saying you look nice. Or, oh man, that was such a great sermon. Or, and please, if I did a good job, don't feel free to tell me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I will take that. But <laughs> someone who just constantly is flattering you off of every little thing, then you need to watch out for that person. I remember I'll just use this as an example. You know, I pray that my preaching gets better and better and better. And it does. Usually when you preach, the more you preach, the more um, your preaching will get better, after, you know, over time. I remember just first starting out when we had the preaching class last year at Faithful Word. I was doing a really bad job. This is my own opinion. So anyone who's heard any of those sermons, please do not chime in right now because that's, <laughs> your opinion's not valid at this moment. But, <laughs> but I didn't think my sermons were that good, just in the sense that I was trying to, I preached before, but I was just trying to kind of work on it, and I was kind of adjusting and stuff like that. So, but I had people at the church. So I'll give you two examples. So I had one person, and that person has been kicked out and started a church in Florida, and it's called Valiant Something Church. So you fill in all the blanks. Well, that person was saying, oh, you're doing a really good job. Oh, yeah, just keep going. And don't get me wrong. I think we should encourage people to keep preaching. You know, obviously, um, if someone's trying to learn to preach or someone wants to be a pastor or someone wants to do a good work for God, we shouldn't discourage them. But what you can do is this. You can criticize them constructively. We call that constructive criticism. You can tell people where they're wrong in errors, where they can improve, so then that person will become better. So you can say something like, hey, you did a good job, but this is where I would say you should improve. I remember asking someone, Baker, about that, and that person was telling me, oh, you did great. You did a really good job, you know, because that guy wanted me to move down to Florida with him, so that's why he kept saying that. But I talked to another guy in my class, and he told me, he was honest with me. He said, you know what? You didn't really do a good job. This is what you need to improve on. And you know what? I actually thanked that guy. I was like, well, thank you. And it took, you know, yeah, it hurts when you get crit when someone criticizes you or they give you constructive criticism or they correct you when you're preaching. But in the end, it's going to make you a better preacher. So that's why I do encourage all the guys who, when the preaching class gets started, take advantage of that, you know, especially even if you don't want to be a pastor, I think it's good just to have that opportunity. So because say a pastor burns in sick one day and he needs someone to fill in, at least you've had that experience preaching. So you can actually get in front of a church and be able to preach to people. And it would be a good message. You know, it's just not, it won't be a message where people are just like cringing at it because the more you preach, the better you, you should get. And obviously pastor burns will tell you where you where you can improve in and even when you listen to your own sermons because that's what I used to do I would because pastor you put all the pri videos on private when we would preach at the preaching class and he would I would listen to my sermon and I would see all the stuff I did wrong and try to improve on that and see where I can what I can do better and that's how you should do it so you can be an effective preacher you can get your points across and you can uh, it can help you when, you know, just say if that time comes where you get to preach a full sermon where you can actually preach it and you can do a really good job. Now, I don't know why I even started talking about that. Uh, I don't remember. Whatever. I, I know I had you turn to Proverbs 6. So in Proverbs 6, this is talking about a, a wicked woman. And it's talking about a woman that's using flattery to get a person to whether, I, I believe in this passage it's talking about, I guess it's adultery, but maybe she's the adulterer. So I guess it's either fornication or adultery. But it says this, to keep thee from the evil. Oh, sorry, I didn't tell you, tell you where to turn. Look at verse 24. It says, to keep thee from the, from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for precious for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth unto his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent. So it's talking about this evil woman. And when we think about people committing adultery, and even the statistics show men are more likely to commit adultery than women. I think. If, I don't know if I have my numbers right, but it's like of cases where of infidelity, it's like 70 something percent men a lot of the time when it happens when someone's committing adultery. But these men are not just committing adultery with themselves. They're actually finding a woman to commit adultery. And it says to keep thee from the evil woman because that person that that man is committing adultery with is an evil woman. And what is she doing? She's using flattery. She's using flattery to get these people to end up committing adultery or to end up sinning against God. And it says lust not after a 
beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. So we shouldn't just think because someone's pretty that we need to go commit adultery with her. And we shouldn't let that pretty lady who's sitting there, like when you go to um, a restaurant and the waitress wants extra money, so then she starts buttering you up and saying everything nice just so you can give her a higher tip. That's kind of how a wicked adulteress is, is that they try to butter you up, they try to flatter you and say as much things as they can for you to sin against God. And what the Bible's saying is that when a person ends up getting into something like this, they become really ineffective. You know, think about just a young man who wants to be a preacher and he ends up getting caught with, you know, caught up with some girl, whether she's really pretty, and he ends up uh, committing fornication or she ends up just doing something that causes him not to be able to serve God anymore. Well, that guy's going to be ruined if he doesn't get things right. That's why the Bible says, or find the right type of woman. So he shouldn't just let some lady who's sa sitting there saying everything he wants to hear end up bringing him down so he won't be able to serve God. The Bible says in Proverbs uh, 31 30 it says favor is deceitful and beauty is vain but a woman that feareth the Lord she shall be praised so you shouldn't just find some girl who's just always saying nice stuff about you now you should find a wife that does say nice stuff about you it shows she loves you but I'm just saying if she's just constantly buttering you up and saying stuff and you guys are not even married yet there may be a problem there it may the woman may be trying to catch you in a snare and obviously if it's a horse woman she's probably gonna try to get you to sleep with her and same with guys you know women uh, obviously shouldn't let some guy and obviously it happens a lot more with guys where the guy just says the right things ends up deceiving a woman and then the woman ends up uh, you know, getting taken by this guy and, and ends up committing fornication or something like that. You shouldn't let that happen. You shouldn't let someone just stall you up and start saying all these things to flatter you, to end up deceiving you and end up, you know, causing you to sin against God. And that actually gets into my next point is that you have deception, first of all, through lies. And then you actually have, you have deception through flattery, where people try to deceive you because they try to use flattery in order to deceive you to get whatever gain they can, whether it's to destroy your life, whether it's to, to get money from you. I mean, think of the bombs. Oh, that's a nice car. You got $5 so you can give me so I can get gas money to go to Mexico or something. You know how it is. That's, but you don't want people to just use flattery all the time to, or you don't want to just listen to someone who's just always trying to flatter you to end up to deceive you in some way, form, or fashion to bring you down. Now, my next point is just deception through sin. And I want you to turn to Romans chapter number 7. Romans chapter number 7. Now, in Proverbs 1.10, I'm just going to read this out. It says, My son, and sinners, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. So this goes both ways where you're getting deceived by sin. There are people out there who can deceive you to try to sin against God and uh, do different things that you're going to sin against Him. But a lot of the time when sin comes, it comes from your own heart or your own lust or just something that's inside of you that, that ends up making you sin against God. Now, as you turn to Romans chapter number 10, because this is a really good passage because it says this in um, Romans 7. I, I may have said 10, but I meant Romans 7, 10. And it says, And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just and good. Was then was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin that it might appear but but sin that it might appear sin working death in me by that which was that by that which is good that sin by the con by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. So what's going on is if you look back at verse 11 it says for sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. Sin is something that's really deceptive. Sin, people try to promote sin and try to make sin look like it's something that you're going to you're going to have pleasure in. And the Bible does talk about having uh, pleasure in sin for a season, but it's something that's going to bring you down and just like Paul says in this passage, it ended up slew, uh, slewing him and ended up killing him. It ended up bring him down in his life. Now, go with me to Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23. While you're turning there, Hebrews 3, 12, the Bible reads, it says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So the Bible even talks about sin being deceitful. I don't know the saying, so I'm not even going to try to butcher it, but it's like sin's going to take you far, farther than you want to go and higher than you want to. I don't remember the saying, but it's a good saying. Find it on Google and then 
put it on your wall or something. But, um, and then there's different sins that are going to deceive you. For instance, alcohol is a big sin that will deceive people. The Bible talks about in Proverbs 20, verse 1, it says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Alcohol is something that will deceive you. And our society likes to promote alcohol to make it look like it's this fun thing that when you drink something that smells like urine, that you're going to have all this, this great time. But the Bible says anyone who drinks it is not wise. If you're an alcoholic, if you drink alcohol, even just one sip of it, the Bible says that you are not a wise person. Now, as you go to Proverbs 23, look at verse 29. It says, who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babblings, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine, look not upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright, at last it biteth like a serpent, and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thy heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They, they have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beat me, and I felt it not. When I shall awake, I will seek it yet again. And alcohol is a really deceptive thing. And if you even see in this passage, it says that someone's going to go through all this stuff, that they're gonna, their eyes are going to behold strange women, their mouth, they're going to say all these perverse things, they're going to be stricken, they're going to to have wounds without cause. A lot of things are going to go on in this per person's life, and what are they going to do? They're going to go right back and go drink alcohol again. And it's something that we shouldn't get into. Like I said, our society likes to promote it. They like to make it look like it's something that's going to, that you're going to be benefiting off of. And there's no benefit of drinking alcohol. It's a really deceptive thing. It's, a really, it's something that can deceive you when you get caught up into it, especially if you become like an alcoholic where you're really dependent on it. And something that, as Christians, we need to just totally stay away from. We shouldn't even look at alcohol as this passage even says or even just think about drinking it because it's you're just going to be wasting your time you're going to be deceived by alcohol but another thing go with me to proverbs 7 proverbs 7 <coughs> another thing that's going to deceive you is the sin of fornication you know it's something that um that the bible talks about is deceptive that if someone where it you know, our society likes to glorify fornication, make it look like it's all good. But I'm sure a lot of those people who fornicated, especially someone who's gotten saved, regrets it. And it happens a lot of the time. And it's something that's deceptive. You know, if you're single, you're not married, you need to stay pure until you get married. And that's what the Bible says. But it says in Proverbs chapter number 5, verse 7, it says, That they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. Look at verse 13. So it talks about a woman that, it's talking about the word of God keeping thee from the strange woman, and a woman that's going to flatter with, with her words. But it says, so she caught him, in verse 13, so she caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, I, will ca I have peace offerings with me this day, and I have paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thee, thy face, and I have found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace our, ourselves with love. For the, good man, for the good man is not home. He has gone a long journey. He taketh he taketh the bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattery of her lip, the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth straightway, he goeth after her straightway. Sorry, I'm kind of getting mixed up. It says he goes after, after her straightway, an ox goeth to the slaughter, as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as a Fool to the correction of the stalks, till a dart strike through her liver, his liver, as a bird hastened to the, to the snare, 
and know not that it is for his life. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths. For she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. So what the Bible is saying is that you have this woman, and she's just going to become a stare unto you because she wants you to fornicate with her, or she wants you to commit adultery with her. And she's going to be a snare unto you in the sense that just like a bird goes into a snare and he doesn't know that his life is gone. Well, when you commit fornication, that's what ends up happening to you. You're just like a bird ended up going into a snare and not knowing what's going to happen with your life. And it says in verse 26, for she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. And that's a quick way to slay your testimonies when you end up get, end up fornicating, because that will get you kicked out of church. That's simple. So it's something that you shouldn't be deceived by. You know, you should just wait until you're married if you're not married and just take that time to wait and not let some woman end up causing you to become to, to end up sinning against God because it's deceptive. I mean, our Hollywood tries to promote it. Uh, the world tries to promote it. But in the end, it's something that God will definitely punish you for. So it's something you want to watch out for. And same goes with adultery. I mean, we talk about adultery a lot with divorce and remarriage, but someone shouldn't. I mean, that's something you should never do is that you should never cheat on your spouse. That's a wicked thing. And I believe that's something that gets you kicked out of church even quicker than committing fornication. And same thing with pornography. I'm just going through all these because those are all things that are really deceptive, especially pornography, because a lot of people think that they can just look at pornography and uh, just glance at some things and it's not going to affect them, but it will affect you. It's going to destroy your mind, it's going to destroy your heart, and it's going to lead you into other bigger sins that you can commit and you're going to end up sinning against God. Now my last point is this, and go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. While you're turning there, I'm going to read a few verses. And this one's more about yourself, because I believe there's deception that comes from your own heart, that comes from yourself. Not just from someone else, but people deceive end up deceiving themselves. The Bible says here in First John, or in First John 1, 8, it says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So if someone says, and this is a really good verse out soul winning. I've met many people who say they've never sinned before. And I turn to this verse and then they still say they've never sinned before. And I just close my Bible and walk off and go to the next door. Because <laughs> that person you're going to waste too much time on. But it's a really good verse to show that, hey, if you say you've never sinned before or you don't sin or you don't have any sin, you're deceiving yourself. The Bible says in James chapter number 1, verse 26, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. So if someone seems to be religious, they seem to be doing a lot of good things for God, but they don't know how to bridle their tongue, that person's deceiving them own, their own selves, and that person's religion is vain. All the stuff they're doing doesn't matter because they don't know how to bridle their tongue. They don't know how to you know, not say the wrong things. Not only that, it says in Jeremiah 17, 9, it's another really famous verse. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We shouldn't follow our hearts. You know, that's something that you should never do because your heart's not, is going to deceive you. When you go see some pretty girl that's not in church, that's totally unsaved, she's a Catholic, and then your heart's going to be deceived by her beauty, and you're going to go run to that girl, and you're never going to come back to a church like this. You're never going to do anything for God because you're going to be deceived by your own heart. So you don't follow your heart. You follow what the Bible says. You follow logic. And if the Bible tells you you shouldn't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever, then don't do it. Even if you're really infatuated with someone, you know, it doesn't matter because you know what the Bible says, and you know the Bible says you shouldn't be marrying someone who's not a saved believer. Now, I had you go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, because in 1 Corinthians 3, the Bible reads in verse 18, if you look at verse 18, it says, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seem to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. So what the Bible is saying here is that let no man deceive himself. If any man seemeth to you, seemeth to you 
to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. So don't deceive yourself that you're just a smart person or you're just this wise person that you just know everything and that you can handle anything. And the reason I'm applying this specifically to false doctrine where you think you can go and watch all these different people on YouTube and think that it's not going to affect you. Well, it will affect you one and eventually when you just keep watching these people. I remember a situation, for instance, I was at, I was visiting Steadfast and Pastor Romero was talking to this person, and I ended up, uh, he ended up kind of like pawning it off to me, <laughs> and I ended up talking to the person, and we were both questioning if this person was saved, and the reason why, because it was like a husband and his wife, and the reason why we were questioning if this person was saved is because the person was listening to Pastor Anderson, but then they were listening to Paul Washer at the same time. So when I start questioning him and talking to him, it seemed like they were just mixed up on a lot of things. Because they're like, yeah, we agree that you can't lose your salvation, but if someone doesn't have works to show that they're, you know, that they, they, they've gotten saved, then that person's not really saved. So this person was totally confused. And why was that? Because they were watching these false internet prophets. And that's something we need to guard ourselves too. Because one thing when you start watching false prophets on the internet, one thing you're gonna start doing is you're gonna start finding stuff that you agree with them on. Because because a false prophet's not always going to say things that are always wrong. They're going to say things that are right. And when that false prophet says stuff that's right, that's good. they're going to deceive you and get you to start trusting them more and more for things. I remember another one of my friends, or for instance, one of my friends, he ended up, uh, he was trying to date a seven-day Adventist, Adventist. And I told him, I said, it's not going to work. So he ended up saying, I'm going to go to her church. And he ended up going to her church. And he's like, I'm going to tell the pastor off and tell him how he's wrong on all this stuff. So after he did this, I ended up going back to him and talking to him. I was like, so how did that go when you went to that seven-day Adventist church? He was just like, well, nothing actually happened. I was like, did they preach any false doctrine? He was like, well, not really. He said everything he said was right. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, you're coming into a battle. And like these false prophets are not always going to say things that are wrong. And sometimes even in churches like that, it takes a while before they start saying what they really believe. Same thing with these YouTube people or people on YouTube that... You're gonna, you watch their sermons, you watch things that they say, and you're, like I said, you're going to start agreeing with things that they say, and you're going to start kind of liking them. And that like is going to get into a point where you start getting deceived by them, and then eventually you're going to get caught up in their false doctrine. When they start saying things that are wrong, you're going to say, well, I see where they're coming from, or they're not, this bad, they're not that bad of a person. And then, therefore, you're eventually going to get deceived by them and get into all this weird and false doctrine. And it's something that we can't handle. You know, some people think, I don't think I can handle it. That's why I don't sit there and just go on YouTube and start listening to all these false prophets. I don't take the time to listen to them. I'll see clips of them saying stupid things, and that's about it for me. I'm not going to listen to their whole sermons because, first of all, I can care less what a false prophet says. And not only that, I don't want to be deceived by them. I don't want to think that we have anything in common when we don't because we don't believe in the same Jesus, first of all, whether it's the, 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 a Calvinist or some Mormon or anybody. We don't believe in the same Jesus, so I don't want to have anything to do with you. So it's just something we need to take heed to, because I've heard a lot of people say, well, I've listened to these sermons by Tyler Baker, I've listened to these sermons, and we see that the more they listen to these things, the more they get caught up in it, yeah. and then they end up getting deceived, and they get out of a good church, and they stop living for God. So it's something we need to watch out for, and I think it's a, my personal opinion, I think it's a babe in Christ mentality to just keep seeking to try to figure out um, how you're going to defend or defeat all these false doctrines. You have the Word of God. If false doctrine comes, you're going to know how to defend it if you're reading your Bible. So it's not something you need to worry about. And if you're just constantly seeking all these false doctrines to see how you're going to defend about it, you already have a problem there. You know, let the do false doctrine come to you first, and then you figure out how to defeat it rather than trying to fight a battle that's not even there. You know what I'm saying? Well, um, go with me to Galatians chapter number 6. Galatians chapter number 6. And while you're turning there, Ephesians 4.14 says that ye henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by, sl by the slight of men and cunning, craft cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So the Bible says we shouldn't be like children being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. I have a son and I've learned this with kids that I guess when you have kids you kind of learn all the stuff that people have already been telling you about kids. but. That kids go through emotions like in zero to 60. I mean, like really quick. I mean, for instance, we'll put our son down on the bed and he'll start crying. And, I, and I, I'm thinking he's faking it. And then he'll start crying like, like, I mean, horribly. I mean, it's like scary how bad he starts crying. As soon as you pick him back up, he stops crying. And then that's it. 
So you don't want to be like a child like that when it comes to doctrine, where you're just getting tossed to and fro, where you're, you're, you know, you're a fan of preaching from this church, and then you go and listen to some false prophet, now you're a fan of them, and then you go and listen to another false prophet, and then you're a fan of them. We shouldn't be like that. We should just stick to what the Bible says, stick to people we know that preach the Word of God, and preach things that are right. Now in Galatians 6, chapter number, or Galatians 6, verse 3, it says, And if any man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. So, if you think you're something, like the Bible's saying here, then you're deceiving yourself. You think you're just this big shot, oh, I'm this great preacher, or I'm this great, you know, soul winner, I'm this great, whatever you want to say, whatever you want to fill in the blanks, you know what, the Bible says you're, you're actually nothing, because you're sitting there getting a prideful attitude, thinking that you're this big shot, and you shouldn't deceive yourself. You should have a humble attitude that you, you, you let, you know, the Bible talks about you letting another man praise thee. Let other people say, hey, you know, you did a great job on that sermon. You're, you know, I'm glad to see that you're constantly out soul winning, that you have a real clear pre gospel presentation. You don't have to sit there and boast yourself up, because that's what false prophets do a lot of the time. They try to kind of uh, make themselves look like they're these great people when they're actually not. And we shouldn't have that same attitude. We should just be humble people where we kind of keep ourselves, we keep ourselves low, where we don't don't try to make make it seem like we're these this we're this great person you know it's something that we should definitely stay away from because if we do that we're just deceiving ourselves we're just lying to ourselves now the Bible says this that we shouldn't be deceived I mean it says let no man deceive you by any means so I given I've given you four different ways that we can deceive ourselves I've given I've showed you that you can be deceived through lies you can be de deceived through flattery you can deceive be deceived through sin and then you can also be deceived by yourself by just things you do in your life and it's something we need to all watch out for and I'm gonna leave you with this just thinking about just churches and uh, people in church getting deceived by, for instance, false prophets coming in. You know, you don't want to see this church go downhill. You don't want to see some false prophet come in and start preaching to people and deceiving them and telling them lies and trying to flatter these people or people in this church to get them where it becomes one day that they end up getting that person, getting them out of church. Your goal is to be vigilant. You know, the, the Bible talks about pastors being vigilant, but I don't believe that's just for pastors because a pastor is not everywhere. He's not omnipresent. You know, Pastor Burzes is not omnipresent. <laughs> so he's not going to be everywhere at once. He's not going to know when some false prophet comes in and some, or some person comes in and starts, or infiltrator and starts preaching all this heresy. You know, you have to be vigilant too. And I believe that applying some of these principles to your life and understanding that there's not, there are people out there who are really wicked people and their goal is just to destroy this church or destroy churches like this because they know we're doing a good work for God. Just thinking about Atlanta, I mean, obviously I used to live here, and I'm just, I, sometimes when I drive around and I just see all these houses, I'm just like, man, there's so many people here. I mean, Atlanta is a really congested place, but I don't see them just as people. I see those people as souls. I mean, I see those people as people that, you know, one day they're going to have a destiny either in heaven or hell, and we can change that destiny. You know, their destiny at, at the moment, if they're unsaved, is to hell. But we can change that destiny by preaching the gospel to them and getting them saved. But the thing is, there are not a lot of good soul-winning churches here, here in Atlanta. I mean, I visited, while I was living here, I visited probably 20 churches and couldn't find a church where they went soul-winning solid, you know, where they had solid soul winners. I mean, a lot of the time for the years I was, I've been saved and been going soul-winning, I went soul winning alone. I mean, and it stinks when you go soul winning alone all the time because it just it gets really discouraging, especially when you're in neighborhoods that are unreceptive, and then you have people calling the police on you, and you're by yourself, and you're getting afflicted by all these things. It's not something that you know you're happy about. But now you have a good church here. You have a good church where Pastor Burzens has made that sacrifice to come here and be able to start a church here in Atlanta, so people here can be able to get people who are lost can be reached. So you can have a soul winning church, a church where you can do more for God. And you don't want some wicked deceiver coming in here, tricking you and getting you out of a good church and, 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 and just stopping the work of God. You don't want that to happen. So you want to make sure if you see any of these red flags that you tell your pastor immediately. You know, and there's red flags usually, just like if someone marries the wrong person. Sometimes there are red flags that tell you that, hey, this is not the person you should be marrying. And people ignore those red flags and they end up, once they ignore those red flags, they end up marrying the wrong person. It becomes a disaster. Well, that's the same thing with a lot of false prophets. I mean, the false prophets at our church, I remember at Faithful Work, 
there was a lot of red flags with them. And some of these points were some of their red flags, those red flags I saw with them. But I gave them too much of the benefit of the doubt. And that's something we need to be careful of, is that just giving too much people too much of the benefit of the doubt. We need to make sure that we're not just, that we're, we're vigilant, that we're looking out for this church, because you don't want to see the work of God in this church get destroyed by some wicked false prophet that wants to just come in and deceive as many people as he can and then split this church in half. That shouldn't, you know, that shouldn't be something that we, any of you want to see here. We want to see this church grow. We want to see this church reach more and more people in the city of Atlanta and just in this metro Atlanta area with the gospel. And you can prevent that from happening if you're just vigilant. If you just make sure you watch out for false prophets and you're not deceived by them. You take the time to see, think about the word of God, make sure you apply the word of God to your life and challenge these people. You know, if you see someone doing any of these things, they're just constantly lying or they're trying to flatter you, that you see those things and you, you try to like tell pastor about it. You try to do something so that person doesn't end up coming in this church and destroying the church. So. Just leaving with you, you with that, it's just something to think, away, think about because it's something that we need to be all aware of and just something we need to be aware of that we don't just let false prophets come in, come into churches, not even this church, but other churches. You know, I've been on guard now since all the stuff that's happened at Faithful World, all the stuff in, over the past year. I've been on high, high alert. If someone just comes to me and says one stupid thing, I'm like, what would you say? <laughs> what do you mean by that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and from that day forward, Caleb eyed such and such. Because <laughs> I don't want that person destroying our church. You know, that's the thing about it. And you got to have that same attitude that you got to be on guard. Like I said, you got to give people the benefit of the doubt. But you got to make sure that you don't just you don't just trust everyone. And if you see any red flags that you, you tell pastor or you try to make sure it's not, you know, it's a false flag, not just a red flag. But just saying that, just think about that. And don't be, you know, the Bible says don't be deceived by anybody. Let's start, try our best. Yeah, there are times we are going to be deceived. But let's try our best not to be deceived. And I believe if we apply these principles of watching out for these red flags, then we won't be deceived in our life. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for all you've done. I thank you for the opportunity to preach. I thank you that you've given us your word, that your word has many different things that show us what to look out for if there's someone here to deceive us or someone trying to get us out of a good church. I just pray that we can apply these principles to our lives, that we watch out for these things, and that we don't get caught up if someone tries to split, split this church or if some false prophet comes in. We don't get caught up with that person, that we mark that person to avoid them. I thank you for all you've done, and in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.